Ever since 2014, it's been a tradition that every year I do at least one countdown on the endings of video games in one form or another. First it was final levels, then final bosses, then the endings themselves, then the combination of all three of those things. You would have thought I ran out of material on that front and would have to remake a countdown, but no, today we're talking about the bad endings in video games. Now I know what some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, isn't this just a rehash of top 10 worst finales? Well, no. You see, I'm not talking about bad endings as in bad in quality, I'm talking about bad endings as opposed to the good endings. These are the endings that make you appreciate the good ending that much more, because they show you just how bad things could have gotten had you not done the right thing. Also, aside from that, I'm going to be excluding any endings that are just the true ending, but with a little bit chopped off because you didn't get all the collectibles they wanted you to get. Now with all that said, let's begin. Pikmin has a pretty simple story. Captain Olimar crash lands on a mysterious planet, aka PNF-404, aka post-apocalyptic Earth, and as a result, his ship gets destroyed. There's 30 parts he needs to collect, and he only has 30 days to do it, because his life support systems will only last for that long. Technically, you don't need to get all 30 ship parts, but you do need to get most of them. As you would imagine, the bad ending happens when the time limit expires and you don't have all the parts you need. Now, you may think you haven't figured out what's going to happen when this occurs, but I don't think you actually know. I don't think anyone could have predicted this. Olimar tries to take off because even if he doesn't have all the parts, he at least needs to try, and of course his ship comes crashing down. That seemed obvious, and they could have ended it there, but no, the Pikmin pick him up and drag him to the onion, where Olimar himself gets turned into a Pikmin. I gotta admire the extra mile they went. I mean, they could have just had him crash to the ground and end it there, or have Olimar write a tragic journal entry about how he's about to perish. But instead, they did something this bizarre, and it's a lot more memorable that way. I mean, the other games may have far more content to do with your Pikmin, but none of them have you become a Pikmin yourself. You know, I wasn't the biggest fan of the Catwoman segments in Batman Arkham City. I didn't hate them or anything, they played well, it just seemed kind of like a weird detour from the main story. And they didn't happen frequently enough to feel like a major part of the game, even though an entire page of the upgrades section is dedicated to Catwoman. That being said, however, there is one moment in one of her segments that I do particularly like. It takes place right after Batman got covered in rubble and Catwoman's left with a choice. Does she go back into Arkham City to save him or does she leave Arkham City and let Batman fend for himself? It's pretty obvious what the right choice is here, to the point where there's a green line leading towards the right choice and a red line leading towards the wrong choice. But this video is all about the wrong choices, so what happens? Well, Selina leaves Arkham City and the credits roll. It starts out normally, but then you hear a bunch of explosions and sirens and Oracle saying that Joker's actually won. And then it rewinds and you get to make that choice all over again. I've seen people questioning the validity of this ending, as Catwoman's probably not the only person who could have saved Batman. I mean, Robin does show up in this game. And it seems doubtful that Joker would have survived Protocol 10. Although to that I say, the last we saw of Joker, he was about to be given the secret to immortality. But ultimately, I don't think the logistics of this ending matter, because I don't really think that's the point. With the credits rewinding like that, I interpret this as Selina's conscience catching up to her. She sees the possibility of her walking out and assumes the worst. She can't make that decision. She has to go back and save Batman. Plus, if the post game's anything to go by, it looks like she wasn't exactly done in Arkham City either. You know, there are some games like South Park Stick of Truth or Saints Row 4 that give you a game over, but in a unique way from doing a decision that the game wasn't exactly expecting you to do. So technically, by the loose criteria I consider for this list, I could put those on here. But at the same time, I think it would make this list a lot less interesting if I just filled it up with glorified game overs. But there is one representative I want on here, Paper Mario. 
Unlike those two games, which each pull that trick only once, between Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door and Super Paper Mario, they do this at least six times. Here's a few examples. This ghost here wants me to retrieve his diary, but does not want me to read it. Well, in the words of the great Patrick Starr, no means yes. What's that, Shadow Queen? You want me to become your servant? Well, I did hear you were a really tough boss, and being a servant of the most powerful being in the known universe does seem like a pretty good gig, so I'll take you up on that offer. So let me get this straight. You want me to go on this grand adventure to save all the worlds in the known universe from being destroyed? Why would I want to do that? And that's what sets Paper Mario apart. Plenty of games will pull the game over ending as a joke, but Paper Mario's the only one I know of that'll do it over and over again. You know, one thing in Epic Mickey that I don't think I've seen in any other Karma-based game is in the ending, you get to see how each major choice you've had to make throughout the game has impacted the world around you. During the final cutscene in Epic Mickey, you get to see a montage of the outcomes of a bunch of the different choices you made, such as redeeming or defeating bosses or doing certain side quests for characters. And you do really get to see the consequences of your actions in this ending. If you made all the wrong choices, it's it's actually kind of depressing what's happened to the citizens of Wasteland. Horus has to shut down his detective agency, the bosses are left in pieces, and heck, the animatronic versions of all your friends are stuck in their little head cases. It's nice to see a montage get this specific with how your actions impacted the world of the game. But it's lower on the list because I honestly think it could have gone further. While obviously that montage changes based on your actions in the game, the core ending's the same. There's a big celebration, Oswald gives you your heart back, and you get to go home, and he feels a newfound connection with you. Now you might say it's obvious that the game had to have an overall happy ending regardless of what you do. I mean, it's starring Mickey Mouse for God's sake, but... I don't know. Mickey already unintentionally turned Wasteland to ruin once. I don't think Oswald would be this willing to forgive Mickey if he spent his entire time in Wasteland trying to destroy it even further. Although then again, maybe it does make sense. I mean, the blot does get destroyed at the end no matter what, so I guess people would be celebrating no matter what. And that montage just shows what else is going down in Wasteland. It could have been darker, but for what it is, this is a good, bad ending. The cave is a bit of an odd case for this list, because on your first playthrough, you're probably going to get the bad ending without even realizing there was a good ending. I mean, throughout the entire game, you're forced to do horrible things in order to progress, so why would it ever occur to you that you can actually return your object of desire to the gift shop? And it'd be in your character's best interests to return that object of desire, because if they try to leave with it, they vanish before they get to the top of the ladder. Tying into the opening monologue where the cave says that few people ever actually leave. Few find what they are looking for, even fewer ever leave. And when you make it to the campfire where you first started and see that no one's there, the cave surprisingly doesn't act all that disappointed in the characters. Almost as if he was expecting this, kind of like how you the player probably didn't expect there to be any other choice. Despite the worst possible outcome happening, he manages to put a positive spin on it, saying that, yeah, sure, the characters in the game didn't learn the lessons they were supposed to, and they're pretty much lost causes at this point, but also saying that you the player probably learned to good deal of lessons during this journey, and that he's confident that when you one day traverse his depths, you will make all the right decisions. Someday, you yourself shall explore my mysterious depths, and when we meet again on that journey, I am confident you will make the right decisions. And that makes sense. After all, in his own words, people have been coming to him for tens of thousands of years. He's seen this play out over and over again. He's seen people give in to their selfish desires and overcome them plenty of times. And it ultimately doesn't affect him which path they go down. After all, he's just a talking cave.
Nefarious is a game that's all about being the bad guy. Your main character, Crow, is a villain who goes around kidnapping princesses, and he has to kidnap enough of them to power up a doomsday machine to take over the world. However, while Crow has all the princesses and prince captive on his ship, he starts to bond with them quite a bit. And if you bond with them enough, at the end of the game, you have the option to not start up the doom howitzer and instead take it down and secure a happy ending for just about everyone. Or, you know, you could just start it up and watch the whole world crumble under your tyrannical rule. That's right, you start the machine and have a battle with your arch enemy, Mac. But even though he's powered up beyond belief, the fight's a friggin' joke. The Doom Howitzer is just that powerful. And then you're treated to a montage of the entire world falling under Crow's control. And you get to see all your former companions trapped inside crystals, saying how disappointed they were in you and how they thought they had finally gotten through to Crow. With the exception of May Apple, who, if you couldn't tell, is basically Crow's equivalent of Princess Peach. She's the one he always kidnaps. She actually escapes and plans to rescue the other princesses and overthrow Crow's oppressive regime. And all throughout telling Crow this, she still talks to them like they're still friends. It actually feels really satisfying in an entirely different way than the good ending. The thing that really sets this apart from other evil endings, though, is the fact that this is the logical conclusion to what you've been doing throughout the entire game. This was the goal the entire time. The good ending in this game is just the main character changing his mind at the last second. And while the good ending is definitely a happier and more satisfying ending, this is certainly a good companion to it. Let me set the stage for Danganronpa's fifth class trial. It's for the murder of Mukuro Ikusaba. During the investigation, everyone is present except for Kyoko, who's mysteriously gone missing. Heck, at first, everyone assumed the victim was Kyoko because no one really knew about Mukuro aside from Makoto and Kyoko, and the body had a mask on it, which exploded the moment it got ripped off, so there was no checking the face to see who it was. But anyway, all the evidence found at the crime scene points to the killer being Kyoko. And not only that, but the motive lines up perfectly too, because she's under the impression that Mukuro is the one pulling the strings to this killing game, so she would have plenty of reason to go after her. And not only that, but she's the only one other than Makoto who doesn't have an alibi. And since you play as Makoto, it does not look too good for Kyoko. Sure, she does tell you where she was, but that doesn't necessarily give her an alibi. Alibi. And the thing is, it doesn't seem like it's in Kyoko's character to do something like this. She's the one who got to the bottom of most of these other mysteries. Plus, she seemed very determined to get to the bottom of this killing game and stop it. Not participate in it. But at the same time, if Sayaka's any indication, you can't trust anyone in this game. And the trust that you have for Kyoko is put to the ultimate test at the end of the trial, where she flat out lies in order to save herself. And you have to decide whether or not to call her out on it. Now, the correct answer here is to let Kyoko get away with it. Makoto stands up and says how this trial seems really off compared to the other ones, but before anyone can deliberate on that, Monokuma cuts the trial short, Makoto gets voted guilty, and is then about to be executed, but Alter Ego saves him at the last minute, and he just falls into the trash room, where Kyoko saves him and reveals that there was really no guilty party during this whole trial, and it was just rigged by the mastermind in order to kill off Kyoko because she was getting far too close to figuring out the truth. So, what happens if you decide to play into the Mastermind's trap? Well, Makoto presses Kyoko on the lie, she admits that it was in fact a lie, and says that she lost. She didn't commit the murder, but she lost, and now the mystery of the school will never be uncovered. And before anyone can question her on that, Monokuma cuts the trial short and executes Kyoko. And unlike with Makoto, Alter Ego doesn't come in to save her, so she just dies. And you're given an image showing the aftermath. There were no more murders, and one of Yasu hero's predictions actually came true, which is actually kind of funny considering how out there it seemed. It's also pretty clever that unlike all the other executions in the game, Makoto slash Kyoko's execution isn't obviously tailored to the character being executed, because Monokuma didn't know who he would have to use it on. And then you're sent back to that decision in the trial, just like with the whole Catwoman ending earlier on the list. But what sets
sets this ending apart is the fact that you don't know which choice is the correct one. Sure, in hindsight, it's easy to see that Kyoko was being set up. The culprit in these cases is never that simple. But at the same time, who else would it be? You wouldn't expect it to be set up because up until this point, Monokuma's always followed his own rules. There's no indication that he'd start breaking them now. When I first played through the game, I picked the wrong choice purely by accident. And as soon as Kyoko mentioned falling into a trap, I figured, oh no, I messed up big time, didn't I? In the final mission of Grand Theft Auto V, you start off as Franklin and you face quite a dilemma. After the Union Depository heist, the three main characters are at each other's throats and several people swoop in to take advantage of that. There's Steve Haynes, the corrupt FIB agent who wants Franklin to kill Trevor and Devin Weston, the asshole billionaire who wants Franklin to kill Michael. Now, the obvious correct answer here is to pick option C, don't kill either of them, as that leads to a finale so satisfying, if I were to remake top 10 best finales, I can almost guarantee it would be on the list. But that's obviously not what we're after. If you decide to kill Trevor, yeah, he's a really entertaining character, and it is pretty sad seeing him go, and the ending is fairly depressing, but at the same time, Trevor is an incredibly dangerous person and the world probably is a lot safer without him in it. But then there's the option to kill Michael. You don't want to pick that option. The game is not very nice to you if you make that choice. First, take a look at why you're being asked to do this. With Steve Haynes, while he's certainly not the nicest guy out there, he does have a legitimate reason for wanting Trevor gone. He's friggin' dangerous. With Devin Weston, he wants Michael dead because Michael stopped him from bulldozing a movie studio. Oh, and did I mention, Devin Weston also sent the private military firm known as Merriweather over to Michael's house in order to kill his family. But what really makes this ending tough isn't the matter of who Devin Weston is, but rather the matter of who Michael is. Michael's actually a really nice guy. Well, as nice as a former bank robber with anger issues can be. And he goes on quite the emotional journey throughout the game too. He starts off retired and bored and eventually loses his family, only to later get them back and get his dream job working at a movie studio. And that's a journey that the game isn't shy about reminding you of. I, mean, I don't know what I did to deserve this motherfucking luck. I got my kids back, my wife, and a job that I love. I mean, I made it. They're practically rubbing it in your face that you made the wrong decision. But beyond that, there's still Michael's relationship with Franklin. At the beginning of the game, Franklin's stuck in the hood, trying to move up in the world, but not getting anywhere. That is, until Michael meets him and takes him under his wing and helps him pull off a lot of big heists. So Franklin trying to kill Michael is something so insane that the game can't even seem to come up with a justification for it. Franklin goes on about how Michael was using him, but that couldn't be further from the truth. You could say that Michael treated Franklin like a son, but when you look at the way that Michael treats Jimmy, his actual son, he treated Franklin significantly better. But the consequences go beyond the ending cutscene. I mean, for starters, there's Michael's family. Sure, they were dysfunctional, but they still loved him, and they're freaking out that you just killed him. Not only that, but there's also the matter of Michael's cut of the Union Depository heist. If you kill Trevor, it just gets split between Michael and Franklin. But if you kill Michael, that money's gone because Lester decides that he should just give it to Michael's family as that would be the right thing to do. But the number one sign that you screwed up in this ending is Trevor. You see, Trevor is a raging sociopath who kills people constantly and he is beyond pissed at Michael after the Union Depository heist. So you would think that he would be down to help Franklin kill Michael, right? Well... So what? What are you telling me this for? Cuz, dog, I'm doing this for us. I thought you could. Well, I can't. You're turning on him? I have had enough traitors in my life. Man, your ass could say thank you. Shit. You deserve each other. That's right. You just committed an act of betrayal so disgusting that not even Trevor Phillips wants to deal with you anymore. That's a sign that you screwed up big time. 
You know, in the past, I've praised the good ending of Infamous 2. It really is a beautiful ending that cements Cole as the hero he was throughout the game. And does the evil ending deliver a similar but opposite emotional punch? Yes, but to fully understand it, I first need to give you the context of the decision between these two. You see, in Infamous 2, there's an incurable plague spreading around the entire globe. There's also a beast rampaging through cities and killing millions of people. Now, at first, it might seem like it's mass murder, but in actuality, he sends out a blast that, sure, kills the vast majority of people that aren't conduits. But for the small percentage of people that are conduits, they are not only cure the plague, but also gain superpowers like Cole. And the whole game is spent collecting blast cores in order to power up the RFI, a machine that can effectively kill the beast. However, things become more complicated towards the end of the game, both because of the revelation of the beast's true plan and because of the true nature of the race sphere. As it turns Turns out, it won't just kill the beast, but all conduits. It also might cure the plague, and it ends up doing so in the good ending. However, the key word here is might. At the time in the game that you're making this decision, you have no clue whether or not the race sphere will actually cure the plague. Oh, and to make things even more complicated, Cole's best friend Zeke actually has the plague himself. So yeah, he's gonna die if you can't cure it. So here's the thing, given the information you have with this decision, taking the evil option is actually the smarter route. I mean, for all you know, taking the good guy option might just be destroying the only chance that anyone has of surviving the plague. So yeah, Cole teaming up the beast to help him continue with his plan isn't really Cole being selfish, it's just him doing what he thinks needs to be done. And the game is not shy about showing the consequences of doing so. As you're on your way to send out a blast throughout all of New Marae, everyone has teamed up with each other to stop you. The average citizens and Bertrand's militia have all banded together because they all realize they need to take you out. And they don't really stand much of a chance. You have a final boss fight with Nick, but then you're met with the toughest part of this entire ending, Zeke. Zeke's been Cole's best friend throughout both games and is like a brother to him. And you have to kill him. Zeke knows that he has to try to stop you because if you destroy the RFI, there goes the chances of anyone who's not a conduit surviving the coming months. And it's not a fair fight in the slightest. All Zeke has is a pistol. Cole can easily kill him within seconds. And after witnessing such a heartbreaking scene, the beast himself says he can't continue like this and instead gives his powers to Cole in order to finish the job, which you see Cole doing in the final cutscene. I think the thing I like about this bad ending is that unlike plenty of other evil endings, it doesn't just show the main character becoming a maniacal villain. Rather, it's Cole just doing what he thinks needs to be done. It does show the triumphant side of what Cole's about to bring about, but also doesn't shy away from the horrifying consequences of it either. Instead of it depicting pure evil, it just shows an intense moral gray area, which I think really sets it apart. Number one is the genocide ending in Undertale. Yeah, that's right. As someone who doesn't really talk about Undertale much on his channel, I just have to say, what the heck else was I supposed to pick? I get that there might be some confusion about the criteria for this list, as these endings seem to be all over the place. I guess what I was really going for were bad endings that were both memorable and interesting. And really, what else could I put at number one other than an ending that the game punishes you this harshly for trying to go after? For those who somehow still don't know, the morality system in Undertale is based off of how many characters you kill. If you don't kill anyone, you get the passive fist ending, which is the ideal happy ending to this adventure. To get the genocide ending, you have to kill everyone. And I mean everyone. There's no getting this ending by accident. You have to go out of your way to kill every single enemy you come across. And you have to spend a lot of time in each area as the encounters get less and less frequent as the population gets shaved down more and more. Thanks to this, the game figures out you're going for this ending pretty quickly. And when it does, it does not hold back. 
it changes the game itself so drastically that it put Undertale on my list of darkest games I've played. Granted, if I were to remake that list, I don't know if the game were going to be on there, but it's still on the old version. I personally have never attempted the genocide run, but it's not hard to get the same experience from watching a YouTube video of it. Your character adopts a serial killer-like personality, and plenty of the moments that would have been funny and charming in any other run just turn really uncomfortable and disturbing. And then there's the matter of killing your friends. Sure, some of the other bad endings I've shown on the list also make you do this, but not to the extent here. Here, every single likable character you've met throughout the game you have to kill, except for Alphys. But anyway, you make it to the end. You've trudged through hell. You've finally beaten Sans. What is your reward for all of this? Well, for starters, you kill Asgore almost instantly. Well, actually, Flowey finishes him off in a desperate ploy to make himself seem helpful, but you end up killing him. And once that happens, you're greeted by Chara. Some incredibly disturbing music plays, and he tells you that he was guided by you, the player, to enjoy massacring everyone in sight, and gives you the option of whether or not you want to destroy the world. Although, it's not really an option. Doesn't matter what you pick, he does it either way. But here's where this ending really gets sinister. When you start up the game again, you're not greeted by the title screen. You're greeted by nothing. And when you wait around long enough, you get the ultimatum. You can play the game again, but you have to give Chara your soul. Now, what does this entail? Well, nothing at first, until you make it to the end of a run. You might even forget about that little transaction you made, but once you make it to the end of the true pacifist run again, you find that the ending's ruined! Chara takes you over after you end the game, and it's not even close to being a happy ending anymore! I mean, I guess it's vague enough that you can interpret it where things aren't so bad, but it certainly looks pretty bad! So yeah, this is an ending so bad that if you get it, you permanently ruin the game! I mean, sure, you can go into the game's files to edit it, but unless you cheat, the game's ruined! And that might seem really harsh until you realize that it really isn't. I mean, like I said earlier, there's no way in hell you can get this ending by accident, and the game does literally everything it can to try to stop you from making it to this point. It's basically the game saying, you just had to see every outcome, huh? You just had to know what would happen if you killed everyone. Well, here you go, here's your reward, hope you're happy, you deserve it, you heartless monster! And really, what else could be number one on a list of bad endings in video games other than an ending that's so bad that the game does everything it can to discourage you from getting it and outright punishes you when you do get it? I am Defawfalizer, and I know Doki Doki Literature Club is widely regarded for its disturbing fourth wall breaking, but I just want to take the time here to remind you all Undertale did it first.